Thank you for all coming. Um, not, not just to see me, but thank you for coming to support science. You're all here and showing that you're wanting to know why and how and more. And that's great, because that's what this festival is about, as you've heard. It's about inspiring the next generations of minds. And that's what I'm here to help do. I really want to show what science can do. I mean, what I'm doing today is about zombies, and maybe that's useful to some people, but hopefully we can really make a difference in the future, because we have enough problems in the world, and hopefully science can, can fix some of those. So what am I going to talk about? The mathematics of zombies. But before I do that, I want to give you a bit of introduction to myself. It was actually stolen quite well, so you, you've heard it in Greek, and now it's here in English, so who am I? Uh, I've been in Oxford now as a mathematician for 11 years. I started there as an undergraduate. Uh, I did mathematics as a graduate, uh, a doctorate, and now I'm a postdoctoral researcher trying to understand mathematical biology. What is mathematical biology? Well, I've got a few slides about that in a few seconds, but in a nutshell, it's the idea that I'm trying to take the beauty of nature and turn it into an ugly equation. That's, that's pretty much it. But what else do I do? Outside of maths, I think an idea not communicated can scarcely be said to exist. It's this simple idea that once you have created something, once you have discovered something, if you are not telling someone about it and why they should care, what's the point in doing it? So I go out on the streets in Oxford, Cambridge and London and force people to learn. Usually they're okay with that because I try and make it fun. I've also, as you've heard, uh, worked on a number of TV shows um, to, again, try and make mathematics understandable for the, the wider public. And also recently, I've, been, I've started work at the London Science Museum. So if you're ever in London, uh, drop me an email and I'll give you a, a private tour of the new math gallery opening in two years. Don't all come at once. Actually, all come at once because that will save time. Don't all come individually because that will take ages. Right, mathematical biology. What's that about? I'm going to go on here. Awesome. Mathematical biology. So here's one thing we do in Oxford. We try and understand herding motion. We try and understand global motion of animals. So here we have some starlings. This footage was just taken just outside of Oxford. And what they're doing is called murmuring. All, the, all those little teeny weeny specks of black there is a single bird. And in this murmur, there could be 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 birds. All, that bird, all those single little pinpricks of black can see is in front of it, to the side of it, above it and below it. So you can see maybe six birds that surround it. Yet from those six birds, the entire flock of birds is able to produce this amazing, beautiful, fluid-like motion that you see. And I think that's, that's hypnotic. And what we try to do in Oxford is we try and understand how do birds do this? How are they communicating? What signals are they sending out? What signals are they getting back? But the question you should always ask with science is why? Birds know how to fly. Why do we care? Well, there are reasons in terms of locust swarms. If uh, we understand how locusts uh, swarm together, hopefully we can disrupt that swarming and then perhaps disrupt the swarm and we can save a lot of crops in that way. But that's a serious reason. I'm not a serious man tonight. So the funny reason is behind this film. Who's seen Lion King? <laughs> yep, everyone's seen Lion King. And if you haven't, go see it. It's a good film. This is the scene where Simba is being trapped in the valley, and they send wildebeest in to try and kill him. Now, the animators didn't want to have to draw every single individual wildebeest that you're seeing here. So what they used was algorithms, exactly like the mathematicians are trying to understand to simulate these buffalo wildebeest coming into the canyon, these ones are cell shaded, the ones in the canyon, all computer simulated. I'll stop it there, I don't want to see Mufasa die, it's, it, it's too sad. But they're using the exact same mathematics, because hopefully as you saw when those wildebeest were charging down to the valley, they weren't all running in a straight line, they weren't all running as one, they were weaving in and out, moving together, moving away. That's what we try and understand. Another thing we try and do, well, what I did for my doctorate was understand pattern formation. Animal pattern formation. Zebras have stripes. Fish have spots. 
we kind of know why they do. Because if you ask a biologist, they may say, well, it's for camouflage or for mating reasons or maybe aggression. But how do they get those patterns? What is it that will give the zebra its stripes? We have no idea. And that's what I try and understand through mathematics. Some of you may have seen the recent film uh, Imitation Game, Benedict Cumberbatch, about Turing, Alan Turing. Again, go watch it. It's not a great film, but it's okay. Um, but it's about my hero. My hero is Alan Turing. In the final scene of that film, there is uh, a picture behind him. And that is of his theory of morphogenesis. He was the person 60... 40, 50, 60 years ago, originally thought of this idea of how to create patterns from nothing. And this is what it's doing here. As you can see in the pictures that on, the, on the, your right, we're starting with nothing. We have no pattern. And then all of a sudden, patterns start to exist. And that's what we try and understand. I mean, at the moment, we're trying to understand how patterns form on animal, on animal skins. But the actual idea is much deeper than that. Why do your fingers, uh, why are your fingers produced where they are? Why should you only have five fingers? Why should they always be arranged in the same way? These are the ideas. Why should those patterns robustly form where they do and how they do every single time? But let's get on to what I'm here to talk to today about. Horror. Horror is a strange genre in entertainment. Because if, you, if you're thinking about uh, action, action films, you, you think about, you know, Indiana Jones or, you know, uh, Lara Croft films. You, you want to be that character. You want to be that action character. You want to be able to do all those things. You want to be James Bond driving the Aston Martin. You don't want to be the person getting killed in horror. Why do we watch horror? Well, one idea is that horror gives us a way of understanding fears of our society without being explicitly talked about. So let's take three examples. Frankenstein's monster, vampires, werewolves, all staples of horror. But why do they stick around? Because they speak to us and scare us on a much more fundamental level than just seeing something incredibly scary. Let's take the first one, quite appropriately, Frankenstein's monster. When Frankenstein was written by Mary Shelley, science, in particular, uh, medicine, was having a renaissance of its own. Anatomy was striding along. People now were able to dissect dead bodies and gain an understanding that was never there before. But because of that, people were afraid of what we might find. And that is what Frankenstein's monster is. It's a fear of science. It's a fear that we are playing and tampering things we shouldn't be playing with. And hopefully all of you here tonight do not have that fear. But it's a fear, it's a fear that is real. And what we have to do is try and get people over that fear. We're not trying to build death lasers. We're, well, we, we are, but we can't. We haven't got the funding for it. We would love to build death lasers, but we can't. That doesn't make money. What makes money are medicines, feeding the planet, and just generally having a better life. People will pay for that stuff. Who else did we have? We had uh, vampires. Now, they're really interesting. Vampires, the original Christopher Lee type vampire. He would sit in the castle. Ah, 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 I want to suck your blood. Ah, ah, I will fly down and drink the blood of the pure and the innocent. He's doing exactly, the, he's living out the metaphor of living off the blood and sweat and tears of the working class. That's what the fear of the uh, vampire is. It's a fear of being taken advantage of. If you think about it, all your, all your villagers, they work in the field, they toil, and they live their meager little lives. And then every night, the vampire will come down and feed off them. It's simply a metaphor taken to a literal extent. Our final one. Werewolves, one of my, one of my favorites. Anyone know what the fear of that one might be? Any ideas? So one, I once asked this to an audience, and they said, silver. Who's afraid of silver? Anyway, so anyone, know, anyone any ideas? Shout out. Change. Change. Nice idea. Very good. It's very close, actually. It's the fear of adolescence. Think about it. If you have teenagers at home, or if you are a teenager, 
Most of the time, they're happy, nice, friendly little things. And then all of a sudden, they become these snarling, irrational beasts. <laughs> Does that not sound like a werewolf to you? It's the idea that one day you are going to have to take responsibility for your action. Because what is a werewolf? It is this monster that has no responsibility. It is able to go out, feast, enjoy, and play without worry. Because the next day he will be human again. And so the werewolf is simply the idea and fear of growing up. But let's get to the main guys of tonight. The zombie. The zombie for me has always been a very sad character. I mean, all the other horror villains, they get to have fun. Have you ever seen a happy zombie? <laughs> no, you haven't. My point rests. But what do you think the zombie is the fear of? Any ideas? Any, yep. Fear of death. I've heard, had that one a lot, and it's quite the opposite. There are films that are the fear of death, though. So you've seen these uh, torture porn films, they're called. So like Saw and Hostel. Have you seen these films? Like um, Final Destination. Where the entirety of these films are just to give you a gruesome death. You get six teenagers, and you hack, and you slash, and you butcher. That's all those films are about. It's because, you know, being living in a Western civilization, we can pretty much get you know, 70, 80 years of life, and the only way that you're going to be killed is by having your life taken away in some nasty way. And that's what those films feed on. It's that taking it away in the most nasty way possible. But zombies aren't the fear of death. Zombies are the fear of life. Take a look at that sack of meat sitting, sitting next to you. Ugh. Yeah. You don't know what it's thinking. It gets up every day, eats breakfast, goes to work, does it, comes home, eats dinner, goes to bed, gets up, eats breakfast, goes to work, and gets to work, and then goes back to bed. It's the fear that we're a cog in the machine, that we have nothing to live for, that every day we will do the same thing, and then one day we will die. The zombie is a sad, sad monster. Don't be a zombie. But let's, let's uh, ask some questions. If we're going to try and stop the zombie apocalypse from happening, we've always got to ask questions before we charge him with some mathematics, because the questions will direct the mathematics that we use. First question, how long do we have to prepare? Very important question. The signal goes up. You get an email. Oh, the dead have started to rise. Oh, no. How long do we have before that the dead are knocking at that door? Well, not knocking. Charging, breaking down, and eating everyone in their path. How long? We now know how long we have. We've got food. We've got water. We've got weaponry. Can we stop the invasion? Because uh, the food and water we have will only last so long. And to go back to the society we have, we have to wipe out the zombies. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, can we survive? Now, let me give you a bit of history in terms of mathematical zombie modeling. A few years ago, there was a Canadian, uh, well, Australian mathematician now living in Canada, who wrote a paper on zombies. But he assumed that zombies are always with humans. Now, I don't know where you, keep, you guys keep your dead, but I usually keep them in a graveyard. And I don't live in a graveyard. So what we decided was that, well, let's put a spatial element into this. Because his original work said that humans couldn't survive. But we only couldn't survive because your humans and zombies are always mixed together. Let's put a spatial element in. Let's put our zombies in their graveyards. Let's put our humans in the cities and see what happens then. Can we survive? Well, if we're going to add space, we better know how zombies move around. And here's some documentary footage to at least tell you how they move. So there's driving eating back. 
So what did we learn from that? <laughs> Dunno. Um, but what we learned are two things. Zombies move randomly. That, that's what you saw from the film. They're going, oh, I don't know where I'm going. I have no reason to go anywhere. I'm not. They move randomly. And they're spreading out. Okay? Your zombies may all start in one area, but they're going, oh, where am I going? I don't know. Here we go. And I'm spreading out. That's what a zombie will do. Spread out and move randomly. And that's exactly the mathematics we're going to use. We're going to model them as random movers. Okay? To do this, we're going to use the mathematics of diffusion, which is perfect. Because what is diffusion? It's the random motion of particles. And here's an example. If you put ink in water, do not stir it or do not heat it, then eventually the water will become all one color. In this case, blue. You won't get patches of blue, you won't get stripes of blue, you won't get clouds of blue. Eventually, your blue ink will spread out and completely cover the water blue. That is diffusion. Here's some footage of, uh, just to drive the idea home. There's some bromine gas in the bottle at the bottom, air in the top, and the, the gas is just released. The bromine gas starts at the bottom, and 50 minutes later, it goes further up. 30 minutes later, it's further up, 45 minutes later, further up. After an hour, it's completely uniform. You don't get blotches, you don't get stripes. You just get one uniform color of bromine throughout the, throughout the bottles. This is exactly what's happening. Each bromine particle is bouncing off itself and off the air particles and slowly spreading out randomly throughout the space that it can. This next, next experiment is quite interesting. The bottle on the left is now evacuated. There's no air in there, there's no gas, nothing. There's bromine in the bottle on the right. The bromine is released, and instantaneously, almost, you get a uniform color. There's nothing in the way to stop the bromine from moving, and so the bromine just rushes in and fills the space. So we're going to be using diffusion to model the zombie motion. Random motion spreading out. And this is an equation. Now, in mathematical uh, communication, they say for every equation you show, you lose half your audience. So you guys are gone. I'm talking to you guys, so you're still with me. Now, there's two more equations in this. So you guys are gone, you guys are gone, it's you and me. Okay? By the end of this, it'll be you and me fighting the zombies. Everyone else, they'll be eaten. Okay? I don't think we're going to survive. Sorry, but, you know, it's, it's not going to work. Um, Okay, everyone just try your best and we'll see how far we get. So this is the diffusion equation. This is an incredibly important equation. I'm using it to model zombies, a stupid application. But this is the equation behind water in soil, behind oxygen in your blood, behind gas in the air. It's why you can smell me. Sorry about that. But this equation, this simple equation, models any motion that is random and spreading out incredibly important. And now, you don't need to understand it, but we'll try and give you an intuitive idea of what's happening. Over here, we have change in number of zombies over time. So the letter Z, if you see that, that means zombies. T means time, X means space, and the DZ, that, that uh, parameter grouping there, DZ, is the speed of the zombies spreading out. So on my left, on your left, or my left, I don't know, Change in number of zombies over time. We want to know how the zombie population changes over time. On the right, change in number of zombies over space. So these are linking the exact things that we want to understand. How does the population of zombies change in space and time? We start them off in one place, we let them go, where will they be an hour later? That's what we want to know, and this is the equation that will do it for us. To try and understand it a little bit better, let's look at a graph. So let's suppose we have a, a profile looking like this. We have a load of zombies on the left, 
not so many on the right. Okay, so let's say we have um, uh, a graveyard and a library. I don't know. Where, I don't know. I don't know where you keep your dead here. I don't know. So, a lot of zombies. At the peak, just before the peak, we have an arrow pointing up because the graph is increasing. At that point, we have that dz by dx, the derivative, the direction of the graph is positive because the graph is positive, it's moving up. After the peak, the graph is going down. The arrow is pointing down, the graph is going down. And so what that means, dz has gone from positive to negative. It's positive on the left, negative on the right. Going up on the left, down on the right. The reverse happens at the trough. It goes down on the left, up on the right. You have a negative derivative there, positive derivative there. We now look at the second derivative. And that tells us how the first derivative is changing. We just said that the first derivative is going negative at the top because it's going from positive to negative. It's decreasing, and so the second derivative is negative. Look at the trough. We have uh, an arrow going down, then an arrow going up. The derivative is increasing, and so the de second derivative is positive. Increasing derivative, second derivative, positive. What does that mean with the equation? If we look at the, the, the peak again, we've said that that term is going to be negative. Well, if we look at the equation, that means the right-hand side is going to be negative. That means the left-hand side is going to be negative. The left-hand side is negative. That means the rate of change of the zombies in time is negative. That means our zombie population will be decreasing. So that means at our peak, the zombie population will decrease because they're spreading out. At the trough, dz squared by dx squared, the second derivative is positive. That means our right-hand side is positive, the left-hand side must be positive. dz by dt, the rate of change of zombies over time is positive. That means our population of zombies is increasing at the trough. This should make sense. Our population of zombies is spreading out from the peak and filling in the trough. So there's these, this equation is doing exactly what, what we want it to do. Now, if you haven't understood any of that, do not worry. Neither have I. And I work with this every day. Here's a simulation of exactly what I'm talking about. Imagine a, a cityscape like this. So we have a cemetery, mortuary, my basement, wherever you keep your dead. I don't know. And this is what diffusion will do. It takes those peaks, it makes the zombies spread out into the troughs. And so eventually, given enough time, the zombies will spread out everywhere. Okay? First important point. Even if you separate yourself from the zombie, the zombies will eventually get everywhere. And this is the graph that will tell you how long. You can use the information from the graph to tell you exactly how long it will take a zombie to get to you if you're between 50 and 90 meters away and your zombie's moving at 110 to 150 meters squared per minute in terms of diffusion. Now, you may be wondering where I got this data from. Well, my maths department in Oxford is around about 100 meters away from a graveyard, so that's why I use that. But you may be wondering about the, the diffusion rate. Where did I get that data? Well, I actually asked my wife, who's sitting over there right now, <laughs> I asked her to act like a zombie and walk up and down, and I timed her. I did it three times and took an average, so it's fine. It, you know, it's scientifically accurate. But, uh, so this, that's where my data came from. And so if you want to know, my wife moves at a diffusion rate of 115 meters squared per minute. That's what I'm basing this on. But the diffusion equation tells us much more than this. It, tells us, it gives us a strategy to extend the time as much as possible. Consider slowing the zombies down. Instead of running away, you try and interact with them and you slow them down by putting barricades out or fighting with them, something like that. You, what are you giggling at? <laughs> you want to fight a zombie? So, right, we slow the zombie down. We move along that direction of the graph. Does this have a pointer? Let's have a look. Oh, look at that. Ooh. So, if we try and slow the zombie down, we move this direction along the graph. 
So even if we're 90 meters away and we're moving very, our zombies are moving very, very fast, if we slow them down, we gain about 10 minutes. 10, 10, what can you do in 10 minutes? Not much. I can't even eat a sandwich in 10 minutes. It's not but let's now run away from them. Let's say we're 50 meters away, we run to 90 meters away. We start at five minutes and we increase the time to 25 minutes. We've gained 20 minutes. Now that's more like it. Now I can have a cup of tea and a sandwich. I'm British. That's what I do with my time. So this gives us what we have to do. It gives us our first strategy to what we have to do with zombies. Do not interact with them. It is much better to run away than to try and slow them down because your time of interaction will increase more. And this becomes from the diffusion equation. What you find in the diffusion equation is that time and space are linked linearly. What that means is if you, uh, sorry, time and diffusion rate, sorry, I missed that up, messed that up. Time and diffusion rate are linked linearly. If you halve the speed of the zombie, you double the time. If you uh, slow a zombie down by two thirds, your time will increase by the same factor, three over two. You, you reverse the factor. Not very good. What about space and time? Well, that, well there we get, we get better savings. We, space and time are linked quadratically. If you double the space between you, you times the time by four. If you triple the space, then the time of interaction increases by nine. Multiply your distance by 10, the time will increase by a factor of 100. And so it is much, much, much better to run away be the coward, I won't judge you, your friends might. Run away and you will live to fight another day. And that's, we've not even added in interactions yet. All we've done is considered how the zombies move. That's the power of the mathematics. We have one idea, we get as much out of it as we can. One idea of movement, one strategy. But let's have a look at some interactions. First interaction. The good interaction. We can come across a zombie. Here we go. Bang! And we kill the zombie. That's the good interaction. That's the one we want to happen. Unfortunately, most uh, films have the other interaction. Along comes a zombie. Nosh, nomni, nomni, nom. And, uh, yeah. D doesn't, doesn't last very long. But that isn't the worst interaction. This is the worst interaction. The zombie comes along, bites us, but we get away. We may think, yeah, we've got away, we've not been killed. But we have to suffer a fate worse than death. We get turned into a zombie ourselves. So we're going to consider these three interactions. We can kill a zombie, zombie can kill human, and we can be zombified. Three interactions, we kill zombie, zombie kills us, we become zombified. And these occur at three different rates. We, can be, we kill the zombie at rate A. Zombie kills us at rate B. Zombie zombifies us at rate C. And these rates, A, B, and C, tell us how likely or how often these things occur. If A is really large and B and C are not, what that means is that we're Rambo. We're, we're taking out zombies left, right, and center, and they're as deadly as a chihuahua. In which case, you probably might feel a bit bad. You know, uh, uh, I was only trying to help. You know, if, so if zombies really aren't that dangerous, make friends with them. What are you doing killing them, you bad, bad people? Anyway, that's that case. That's the case we'd love to happen anyway. That's the case where we're in control. But anyway, here are the equations that govern that, those uh, interactions. So I've lost you guys now, down to you guys. Here are the, can you even see these equations up there? You, oh, they're there. Okay, okay, you can see. Fine, good, excellent. So we have these two equations. Same as we had last time, diffusion takes the main part. So on the top one, this is the human equation. So wherever you see a H now, that's human. And we have the first bit meaning diffusion. And there is the zombie diffusion again. Now, as I said earlier, diffusion means random motion. Random motion. How many of you move randomly every day? 
Not I said some over there. Not many, I assume, except for those guys. As I said earlier, you get up, you go to work, you go home. You get up, you go to work, you go home. You are moving randomly. But what I'm going to say is when the, the zombie uh, apocalypse start to occur, you're not going to go to work that day. You're probably going to start running away, trying to escape, spread out, randomly move away from the cities. Okay? So that's why we're using diffusion as to use against human, uh, human motion. Humans are panicking, so they're moving randomly. Zombies are moving randomly because they don't have anything better to do. So that's the motion. Now let's, the, the extra terms, these two guys, these are the interactions. We have minus alpha HZ. Hey, alpha, that's Greek. Yeah. I'll tell you one thing. I've, oh, it's brilliant being a mathematician in Greece. Because we use your alphabet, I can sound out the words, and they're not too different from English words. So I've been, you know, I've been saying to my wife, I can read Greek! I can, no, you can't. The English is done beneath it. No, you can't. But I can read, no, it's really because on the plane, like Exodus, you know, for exit. I can, you know, I can read this stuff. You know, it's good. Anyway, so back to the maths. Human equation, minus alpha hz. Whenever a human meets a zombie, h times z, we get removed at a rate alpha. Alpha is b plus c. And I don't know if you remember, because I've been talking so much, but b was the rate at which we are killed, and c was the rate at which we're zombified. Those two uh, reactions remove us. So we are removed, removed at a rate a, which is b plus c, the rate at which we are killed, and the rate at which we are zombified. Zombies have a plus beta hz. So whenever a human meets a zombie, two things can happen. Either a human is become, becomes a zombie, or we kill the zombie. So beta is c minus a. c is the rate at which we are zombified, increasing the zombie population. And a is the rate at which we kill zombies, decreasing the zombie population. And now from this formulation, all we've done is written down some equations, but again, it tells us something that we can use. Alpha is always positive, because B and C are positive. A, B, and C are positive. So alpha is positive. That means our population is always decreasing. This is minus alpha HZ. We can never increase the population of humans by meeting a zombie. I shouldn't have to tell you that. But you'd be surprised about how many people I do. Don't meet a zombie. The worst that can happen is you die. Or the worst thing that can happen is you become zombified. Don't interact with zombies. The humans never benefit from it. But let's look at the zombie equation. We have a beta term. Plus beta hz. Beta is c minus a. It increases at a rate c, the rate at which we, zomb we get zombified. And we're removed at a rate a, the rate at which we kill zombies. So beta can either be positive or negative. If C is really big, then uh, we're being zombified. You know, they're very infectious. Okay, it's like flu. You know, a zombie sneezes on you. Ah, oh, you become a zombie. And that's when beta is positive. They're virulent and they're deadly. But look at the other case that I mentioned. When A is really big, we're killing zombies left, right, and center. And, and beta is negative. That's the case we want. Because that is the only case when the zombie population decreases. When we are more deadly than the zombies. So there are the equations. If you've not understood any of that, do not worry. Here's a simulation. It's good like this. So what I've got here is there is a line on the top, a black solid line. That represents the human population. And what I've said is that the human population is uniformly spread around okay so that's not not too bad an assumption you know you're pretty much uniformly spread and now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna place 10 zombies in one corner up there I like how many people are looking just to see if I actually bought 10 zombies with me as well so I'm gonna put 10 zombies in one corner and see what happens 10 zombies the red dash line is the zombie population it almost gets wiped out but unfortunately the humans are just too susceptible to the zombie plague. Hum some humans are killed, about half of them are killed, but about half of them are converted into zombies. And sooner or later, the zombies are pushing the humans back, back and back, until we have the last few humans left. Ten humans, eight humans, six, 
four, two, one human left. Blessed is the zombie, for they shall inherit the earth. I think we should watch that again. I don't think you fully took in the horror of what just happened there. <laughs> Have you ever seen a more dramatic graph in your life? We saw Lion King at the beginning of this with the death of Mufasa. Forget that. This is your... Hum Look, we'll watch again. Zombies nearly wiped out. We almost win. But sooner or later, the zombies push back. The humans just can't win. They're too... Terrible. Every human that gets converted is help for the zombies. And finally, and sadly, the human population just can't survive. Ten. Eight. Six. Four. Two. You saw your own death in graph form. <laughs> sad day, sad day. But we can analyze the equations to tell us when it will happen, when, when we will all die. And the equations tell us this. The speed of that wave, so as you saw, there's a wave that traveled across the domain. The speed of that wave is V, okay? And from the equations, we can get V squared. So V squared is positive. Whenever you square a number, you get a positive number. So the left-hand side is positive. We know that. The right-hand side, though, is a combination of parameters. The first parameter is dz. That is the diffusion rate of the zombies. Now, hopefully this makes sense. If you slow the zombie down, you slow the infection down. Makes sense, right? You slow the zombie down, the speed of the, the, wave, the infection wave will slow down, too. There's nothing more difficult than that. Make dz smaller, you make the speed smaller. If you make DZ zero, then there will be no wave at all. Great. What we want to do is, is try and isolate the zombies. The next parameter, beta. Beta is the net rate of increase in zombies. Again, you've seen this parameter. That is C minus A. It's the rate at which we are zombified minus the rate at which we uh, kill them. Okay? So if they can zombify us more than we can kill them, zombies will reign. If we can kill them more than they can zombify of us, beta will be negative. If beta is negative, that side will be negative. The right-hand side will be negative. But the left-hand side is positive. One side is negative, one side is positive. That can't happen. That means a wave can't exist. That means we will not die out. So there is a possibility that we can survive. But we have to be more deadly than the zombies. The final parameter I've not introduced yet. The final parameter is H0, and that is the initial human population. So what this means is that if you remove the humans to, say, an island and fortify that island, then the zombies can't get to you. All humans are are potential infections. So if you remove the zombies away from the humans, you segregate them, you're fine. An infection wave can't exist because there is no infection. However, what it could also mean, if you think about it, is let's say you're in a lecture theater in Greece and the zombie apocalypse kicks off and you're surrounded by people who are not going to be good at fighting. Then all they are to you are potential zombies. So what the maths is telling you is to remove them. <laughs> I'm not saying how. <laughs> you can make your own mind up on that. But I'm just telling you what the maths tells you. The maths tells you to remove the humans. <laughs> so what can we conclude? Well... It's not good, guys. Um, we're all most likely going to die. We tried, we tried our hardest to make us survive. And now there is a book out. It got published last ho uh, Halloween uh, on zombie mathematics. And this talk is one of the chapters in the book. And out of all the chapters that I've read of that book, 
There isn't one that is able to make humans survive. It's not looking good. But what is our best strategy? The math at least has told us what we can do to survive as long as possible. Best strategy, run. That's what the first piece of mathematics told us. It told us to increase the distance between us and the zombie. By increasing the distance, you increase the time from that first interaction. By slowing them down, you don't increase the time as much. So run away and run far. But you can't run forever. That is what we saw in the next piece. The zombies will eventually get everywhere. But the second piece, the interactions, told us that don't interact with a zombie. Isolate yourself as much, much as possible. Only fight with a zombie on your terms because you need to be more deadly than the zombie. Isolate yourself. Isolate yourself from others. Isolate yourself on an island and get rid of the humans as much as possible. That brings me to the end. You can follow me on Twitter or read my webpage. Um, don't follow me like that because that's weird. But I do have, before, before I, I leave you alone, I have one epilogue, one, one end to the story. In England, there is a company called Z Entertainment. And they have hired out a, a, an old decrepit mall, and that mall is going to be destroyed. But until it is, what that company have done is that they've got actors, and they've filled it full of these actors dressed as zombies. Now, I went with my friends. So there, there's me at the back there. There's me, yeah. I went with two of my friends. And because my wife is here, I can't say that was the best day of my life. <laughs> my wedding day was, of course. <laughs> but it's a close second. <laughs> so there we were, me and my friends, fighting the zombies in this mall. Incredible, very, very, very fun. At one point, I get separated from my friends, though, and I end up with this guy here, this, this guy right standing next to me. I am a mathematician from Oxford. I have the, the body strength of a nine-year-old girl. <laughs> he can bench press me. He would fix a car with his teeth. He is a man. I am a mathematician. <laughs> so I end up with him, and we're walking around this dark, quiet mall. And at the end of a corridor, we see a zombie. And we have these guns, so we can run after and we could kill it. And he says to me, yeah, yeah, let's go kill it, yeah, kill it, kill it. No. <laughs> You've obviously not read my thesis. Leave it alone. Increase your distance. So, he goes off and kills the zombie, leaving me and thinking, no, nope, I'm having none of this. I will walk away. And I walk around the corner into another zombie. Thank you very much. <laughs>